say, God, I'm adding you into my equation. I'm adding you into this problem. And when I, God had a purpose for his pit, just like he has a purpose for your pit that you're into, he's not going to let you down. When you believe the Bible and the Bible alone, I said, that's what we, suddenly one day you're going to wake up and you're going to be like, I don't really have animosity towards that person anymore. But I promise you that I think today you'll be really, really encouraged at the very end because I learned something I never even thought of. If you are watching us online or Roku, DirecTV, any of those places or any of our apps, uh, you can find out more about us on womensbiblestudy.com and that's where you can learn about us. Okay, um, if you ever need to get a hold of me, for those of you that are online or you guys here, it's real simple, just lisa at womensbiblestudy.com, kind of simple. Um, th I had a... I just want you to send me nice emails, though, okay? I don't <laughs> want mean ones, okay? Um, I had a, a lady call, because since we're on DirecTV, um, I had a lady call me right after it was over a couple weeks ago. Apparently, I told a joke, okay? Well, you're, she, she's clearly not going to like the one I tell today. But um, she, I didn't take the phone call, so uh, I saw it later, and it was like a four-minute message, okay? And it was four minutes of how awful she thought I was, and how could I ever tell a joke at a Bible study? And I'm like, well, that's just me, <laughs> okay? So, and then here you go, like, turn it off then. I don't need to hear it. So, bad ones hurt my feelings, but nice ones make me happy. So, okay, <laughs> that's how that goes. Okay, um, what happened this week? Good morning. Cheyenne uh, decided to leave me and go away to college. Okay, so most of you that know it, um, last year, we, Cheyenne's dream college was Point Loma. I think some of you know this, some of you don't. Um, she went, she, like, she worked really hard all year, or all um, school to get into this college. So excited. She went for early registration. She got accepted by December. Uh, this summer, most of you don't know this, uh, we went into her room one night and she is crying. And we're like, oh, what's the matter? And she said, I, I don't think I want to go to Point Loma. And we're like, what? Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. We're like, oh, that's so, yay. Okay. So she said, I just don't want to be away from my nieces and nephews and her mother, apparently. She didn't say that, though. But um, so we, she went to, she's going to GCU. She's moving into campus um, she moved in last Thursday, so we moved her in there. And I realized that Rob was not home when our original, our first daughter, Gabby, went to GCU. And when I took Gabby, she was like, um, she cried, and she had to end up coming home, so we had to sleep over that night because it's kind of, it was sad. Um, and then I realized that Rob wasn't home when we dropped Cheyenne off either. So I think this is a pattern with him. Like the boys, he's like, go, go to college. The girls, he would be like sobbing his eyes out. So I think he does that on purpose, okay? But he would not say that. But anyway, uh, so she, we moved her in. And so Thursday, we got her all involved. And then um, we had to go to Target, get some last minute stuff. Came back, she called a couple of her friends like, hey, can you help me move my stuff in? So I pulled up and then she said, uh, I said, okay, let me go park and I'll help you. And she's like, no, no, we got it. I was like, oh, she doesn't need me anymore. Like 19 years of her life and she doesn't need me anymore. So I drove off and I was like, okay, that's six down, one more to go, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and so then I was like, well, it's so weird to just walk, watch her walk in to college. And I'm like, that's super sad. But then about 45 minutes later, I got a text and it said, mommy, I miss you already. Aww. <laughs> so, kind of excited. Okay, so this is what, if you're watching us wherever and you think I'm the weirdest person, you're going to totally think I'm the weirdest person today. Um, last week we talked about bladder infections. Apparently we talk about everything here, okay? I actually had a girl call me this week and say, oh my gosh, I have a bladder infection and I wouldn't have known what it was had you not talked about it at Bible study. So see, it's all good. Now, today we are going to talk about uh, something that happened, I have a friend, and well, most of you know Aaron, and we have this weird thing, like whenever, whenever something big happens, like she sends me a cookie bouquet, and I send her a cookie bouquet, okay? And so it's like her dog died, so I got her all these cookies in the shape of little dogs and dog bones and stuff, and sorry for your loss, and then all my dental work, she sent me this cookie bouquet with all these big teeth on it, and you know, <laughs> it was so cute. Okay, so she calls me last week. She says, I can't go to lunch with you because I have to fast. And I'm thinking, well, you're pretty spiritual. And she said, no, I'm going in for a colonoscopy. <laughs> okay, now, for those of you that don't know what one is, look it up on the internet, okay? <laughs> so here's what happens. A lot of you have probably had it. I never have. But my husband has, and the, and the only thing I can remember 
and this is okay, and this is Bible study, but you just know I have a big mouth, so you'll you'll, you'll get this. I told her the only thing I remember is that before you leave, you have to pass gas. Okay, now that sounds really gross. I totally get that. But so I told Aaron that, and I said, Aaron, before you leave, out, you know, they make you pass gas, and she's like, okay, that's just that mortified her. She's like, that's just totally disgusting and gross. So, the day of her colonoscopy, I called the cookie company. It's called Cookies and Bloom, and I said, my friend is having a colonoscopy. <laughs> And I need you to send her a cookie bouquet, okay? And, and I didn't even know what they were going to do, but I said, you know, the only thing I know about colonoscopies is you have to pass gas. That's all I know. So I don't even know how you're going to do this. So he said, well, no one's ever asked us that before, so I got, I'll get my team on it, okay? So here's what they sent her, okay? And it's this little, it's this little bikini bottom here. <laughs> and then it has these cookies that say toot in the back of it, okay? <laughs> And I thought if you thought that was really tacky, he, he told me later, he goes, I was trying to find a classy way. Because like, I was raised like that. Like, we didn't say that bad like, other word that when you pass gas. So we were, you know, it's like, oh, did you fluffy? Or did you too? Yeah, I mean, those were, so that made me happy because we needed a, a really like, uh, classy way to say that. So anyway, in case you didn't think that was funny, I, I'm appeasing you by cookies, okay? <laughs> this is cookies in bloom. Ah. Okay, and I had them make you each one because if you ever need a cookie bouquet to like totally embarrass your friend, this is the place to do it. They're almond vanilla, they're so good. Okay, so anyway, we wanted you to have that this morning. So there you go. Whew. I put in the very back of your handout too, some of the ways that they, they actually make these cookies. They're so cute. Like they make these like toes and it says, have I told you that I love you? Yeah, I mean, just it's so cute. Like they have these, um, one of them yesterday when I was there picking the cookies up, it says, I hope you get whale, whale, whale. But it was a picture of a whale, and they had fish all over it. So anyway, they're kind of cute. All right, let's talk Bible. Because if you're wondering, like, is this a Bible study? The answer is yes. You'd never know that. All right, today we are going to talk about um, Habakkuk, okay? Habakkuk was a prophet. I'll tell you more about him in a second. But Habakkuk is the one that I relate to the very, very most out of this whole series that we're doing on discouragement. Okay, so for the next few weeks, we're going to take men in the Bible, and we're going to talk about what is it that discouraged them. Okay, Habakkuk, we're starting with him because he relates, I relate most to him than I do anybody else that we're going to be studying. Okay, because sometimes I think that God just isn't fair. Okay, and, and I don't really know where that comes from. I figured it out this week. But for me, sometimes you see people who have really, really easy lives. And then you see somebody who has a really, really difficult life. And you say, really, God? Like, I don't understand why this just doesn't seem fair, okay? Now, I, I, you look at li living in the United States. Uh, we, can, we can eat what we want. We can worship how we want. Uh, there's, there's just no issues here, okay? The other night, we turned on the news. You've got all the Christians in, in Iraq with ISIS has moved in. They've just now, it, it would be like, someone banging through your door and saying, here's your choices. You, you join Islam, or you we cut your head off, or you get out and you own nothing anymore. Like, I don't think we can understand that. But as I'm watching the news, I'm thinking, look at all these people on the mountain. Their kids are starving and they're crying. And I'm like, God, this just is not fair. Like, nothing ever seems fair about this. And why in the world God doesn't step in sometimes, I just can't figure it out. Now, this summer we went to, my parents took us on a trip to California, took the whole family. They got Rob and I a room at a really, really nice hotel right on the water. Okay, so we could watch the waves and we could watch the people and watch everything that went on. So we had like this great week and we got to, um, I got on this bike riding kick, so now I decided that I want a bike and you know, and we could eat out. So we had a really, really good time. So the day before we left, we went to this, this little store and as I walked out, there standing in front of me was a homeless man with no hands, okay? And I'll tell you what, it just ruined me. I said, really, God? Like, I I'm thankful that I'm on this side of the lollipop, but I it's it nothing about this is fair. Like, here's a man who has nothing, and he has no hands, and I get to go ride bikes and eat out and stay, stay at a really nice hotel. Like, nothing seemed fair about it. But somehow, when things in your life and my life don't feel fair, we tend to blame God. And I couldn't figure out why I did that this week. This week. And then finally I figured it out because when Cheyenne lived at home, because now she doesn't, <laughs> it's fine. Um, whenever <laughs> when she lived at home, she would say to me, Mom, it's a school night. Can Emily come spend the night? And we're like, absolutely. 
because we know that Emily and Cheyenne will go to bed. Last week, Dusty, hey, can my friend come and spend the night? Absolutely not, okay? And he's like, what does he say? That's not fair, okay? That's not fair, you used to let Cheyenne, okay? Now, it dawned on me when he said that why I think God is unfair. Because the person who has the power to do something about your situation and they don't in a favorable manner, that's who gets all the blame. And in this instant, we know God is powerful, and we know he's all-knowing, and all, you know, he's, he can do anything he wants. And so when he doesn't step in and do what you and I want him to do, we get discouraged, and that's what happens. So after the man with the whole no hands, right after that we came home. Rob ended up going to China. I went up to Flagstaff. I had one week all by myself. Cheyenne and Dusty were with the Italians. I was here. I went to the Flagstaff, which is, and I was going to study all week. Okay, now it's very, very difficult for me to study when I kind of feel mad at God, okay? And I had to get over this whole God is unfair kind of a feeling that I was, I was going through. So what I did was when I, when I got to Flagstaff, I knew that I had a choice to make, which is what we talked about last week. You and I always have choices. I'm either going to do something to grow my faith and figure the answer, or I'm going to sit home, eat bonbons, uh, eat peanut M&Ms, and watch reruns of Days of Our Lives, okay? Which I don't even know if Days of Our Lives is still on, but in case they are, that's what, what, what my options were. Okay, now, here's what um, God is so good, and I want you to understand this, and Cheyenne said this last week in her blog. If you want to know God, you have to seek him. You have to push forward. You have to, you, you, you have to look for him. Okay, so when this whole thing happened, I said, all right, I'm not going to sit around and watch bonbons. I'm going to seek him. And my, my prayer was, God, I need to know why I think you're unfair. And I need somebody to help me with that. Okay, so we have a Roku up there. And the coolest part about God is that when you actually seek him for something that you're going through, he will come through. And sometimes it'll be a friend just handing you a book. Maybe it'll just be a phone call. When I was studying certain doctrines a long time ago, I, I would be so frustrated with them and I'd turn on the radio and on there a pastor would be talking about the exact thing. So God is really gracious like that. Our job is just going to be to ask him. So I'm like, okay, God, I think you're unfair and I don't know what to do with this. So um, I turned on um, Max Licato, His uh, we have a Roku. So uh, Oak Hills Church is Max Licato, and he always seems to calm me down. And so I said, I wonder what Max is doing this summer. Turned on his summer series, and right in front of me was one screen that says, is God just not fair? And I was like, okay, God is kind of awesome that way, okay? And so this woman comes on, totally mesmerized by her, and I'm going to show you her story. But I know some of you may not know me and my story, so I want to give you just a thumb nail sketch of my story so that what I share with you this morning will have greater context. I was a 15-year-old girl when I began to have difficulty with my eyesight to the extent that I was sent to an eye hospital where the doctors there diagnosed that I had a disease in both of my eyes called retinitis pigmentosa. It was a degenerative disease. At that point, it had deteriorated enough of both of my retinas that I was declared legally blind. I couldn't read off a chalkboard or see the print in a book. My facial features had become blurry when I looked in the mirror. And so the doctors told us not only was I legally blind, but that the nature of the disease was that the same kind of deterioration would continue to occur until eventually I was totally blind. Well, I was 15 when I received that diagnosis. And now I'm 50, and the diagnosis came to fruition, and I have lived in physical darkness now longer than I lived in physical light. But it is through a greater light, the light of God's Word and the light of the world, that I share with you this morning. Amen. Okay, is that the cutest little girl? Like, she's so cute. Like, I just want to talk like her, okay? Because I, I always think people listen better when you have an accent, so I need to go how to train on how to have an accent. Okay, the great thing about her, has anyone ever seen her Jennifer Rothschild before? I had never, have you seen her? Okay, I've never seen her before. She's so cute. And so, of course, when somebody touches my life like that, what do we do? We have to have her come and speak. So she's going to be our very first speaker 2015 in September. Okay. Because she's got a huge, huge story to talk about. But anyway, she wrote a book called, Is God Just Not Fair? And the premise is, is God just or is God just not fair? 
And those, that's where she goes with it. And because for her, she has prayed and prayed and prayed for God to heal her. And God says no. And when God says no to us, sometimes we get really, really discouraged. But what she's realized about how to get out of discouragement is say, okay, God, here's the deal. I need a new perspective. And sometimes that's what we need, a new perspective on our situation that we're in. Um, we learned this from Charlie Brown and Snoopy, okay? Uh, Charlie Brown was feeding Snoopy one day on uh, his bowl of dog food, but it was Thanksgiving. And, and, and Snoopy was very angry because he's like, why does everyone get to eat turkey and stuffing and I get to eat my same old dog food, okay? And he was feeling sorry for himself and then all of a sudden he looked up and he said, well, I guess it could be worse. I could be the turkey, okay? Which is so true, okay? So I think Snoopy changed his perspective and that's what we have to do. Instead of turning around and saying, God, I'm just gonna blame you for everything, we need to get a new whole perspective on what's going on. Because when God says no, it has nothing to do with his fairness or unfairness, okay? It has everything to do with what we talked about the very, very first week. Some of you weren't here the first week, and here's the deal. When you and I, before we become a Christian, um, our life is my story, okay? I don't know if everyone can see that or not. Um, it's, it's all about me. It's what I want to do. It's my life. It's my college. It's my job. Everything is about me, okay? The thing that you, we don't understand a lot of times is that when you and I come to saving faith in Jesus, when we say, Jesus, I want you to come in my life and be my Lord and Savior, here's what happens. We become in his story, okay? And we talked a lot about that the first week, that, that as a follower of Christ, my life is no longer about me. It's about God. We are now a part of his story, and in his story, our job is to go out into the world and figure out how to use what we determine as unfair, and how do we share that with Jesus. So for, for uh, Jennifer, her great thing is that she takes her blindness, and she goes out, and she uses what she thinks is unfair. Instead of sitting around, moping around, she is actually doing something about that. Okay, so now today I want to talk about Habakkuk because in order to understand what is going on with him, you have to understand a little history. So we're going to do like a five-minute history lesson for those of you that know nothing. If you hate history, you can sleep through this, but please don't because, I, you know, I don't like history. I realize this. Uh, my parents took me to see the movie America. I apparently know nothing about the United States history. Like, I'm, they're, they're like, and England came over, and I'm like, England, that's like a... 10-hour flight from Phoenix, okay? Why would England have anything to do with the United States? Like, I had no idea. So I found out on my phone that I have Siri, 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 is that what her name is? And I could ask Siri questions. So I'm like, Siri, how did people get over here from England? And she's probably like, okay, this is the stupidest question. If she was an actual person, she'd be like, you're so dumb. Like, did you not pay attention in high school? No, I didn't. Uh, on boats, dummy, okay? So, but anyway, I don't like, I, don't, I mean, I'm sure I love America, but I just never got into the history. But give me Bible history, and you have made me the happiest person in the whole world. So I want to talk to you. I mean, you. In your handout, you have a map. And I'm going to make this map as big as I can possibly make it up here because I want to tell you what is going on, especially what's going on in the world, too, so maybe you'll get a better view of what's happening here. Um, for those of you that have never, ever opened a Bible, and the reason why this is so much fun is because the Bible is the most exciting book around, okay? It's all about the history of Israel, okay? And for those of you that, that you're gonna be like, well, that sounds boring, but it's really not. Because to me, when I see the history of Israel and I still see that Israel is still here today, it makes me say, God, you are awesome, and this is why, okay? Get a load of this. This is the Middle East. I'm gonna try to have my little hand thing up there. Uh, you can see. Uh, here's big old Iran, mini Iran, and here's Iraq. Look at this little teeny tiny stretch right here. This is Israel, okay? Israel is the size, if you look in your handout, I put two little things. The, the whole co little country of Israel fits inside of uh, Lake Michigan, okay? It's a little teeny tiny sliver in California. Okay, we are talking tiny, tiny, tiny little um, place, okay? And yet, it's still there today because God says, 
Israel is my people and my land. Okay, so let's start and talk about that. Now, three to 4,000 years ago, there's a man by the name of Abraham. He lives up here in Iraq. Okay, no one believes in, in God. No one really knows him, like, uh, he, and God needs to make his ma- name known. So he calls Abraham and he says, Abraham, I want to make you a new nation. I'm going to make your descendants as great as the stars above. Okay, that's how many they're, they're going to be. So he says, I need you to move your family to this, this new land. So Abraham gets his wife Sarah and they move all the way down here to the land of Israel. Now he gets here and the problem is, is that once he gets there, he's like, oh, there's a famine. That doesn't work very well for me. So he ends up taking his wife and he goes down to Egypt, okay? Now they go down there on their way back home to the land of Israel. He takes uh, some slaves, handmaids, maids, whatever you call them. So he's got these little Egyptian maids. So they get back into the, to Israel and, and uh, Sarah keeps trying to get pregnant, trying to get pregnant. And they're very, very old at this time. So Sarah one day decides, you know what? I'm not going to get pregnant. Apparently, God didn't mean you and me are going to have a baby. So I'm going to give you Hagar, my cute little Egyptian maid. You sleep with her. See, if anyone watches soap operas, you don't need to watch soap operas, okay? The Bible is filled with enough of that, okay? I mean, you're talking crazy stuff, okay? So his wife's like, you go ahead and sleep with Hagar, and she'll have a baby, and it'll be ours, okay? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't really work work that way. Uh, Hagar gets pregnant. Sarah hates her, pretty much tells her to leave, like, get out of here. I don't want to see you. And, and so what we're going to find out is that the, everything that's going on in Israel right now with Gaza, you keep hearing Gaza and Israel and there's all these things. It is all because of that dysfunctional little triangle that happened three to 4,000 years ago. Okay, if you look in your handout, you'll see Genesis 16. Uh, Hagar has now left because Sarah is being mean to her. And, and God comes to her and says, uh, says this, the angel of the Lord said to her further, behold, you are with child and you will bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live to the east of his brothers. Okay, so here's the whole situation from 3,000 to 4,000 years ago. Look at who is to the east. Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Syria. Okay, the, the descendants of Ishmael and Abraham is um, yeah, the Arab nation. Okay, so everyone needs to just understand that. So Gaza is filled with Palestinians, the Arab nation, and that is who is fighting Israel. Because now you understand, they all think the land is theirs, okay? They want that land. They believe that their father is Abraham. Now, Abraham finally has a child with Sarah. It's Isaac. Isaac is the descendants of the Jewish nation. So now you have these two warring countries, all because Abraham, three to 4,000 years ago, did not obey God, he and Sarah, and they just kind of did their own thing, okay? So that's what happened. But the amazing thing to me is that Israel is still there, okay? That just kind of always makes me happy. I don't know why. And so whenever people say, you hear, you know, like Iran, like, we're just going to blow Israel off the face of the earth, it will never happen. And that's what's so fun. That's why I love to look at this, because I'm like, that's how big our God is, okay? Now, Uh, Jesus will come back in Israel. When he comes back, he'll put his feet down on the Mount of Olives, which is right in Jerusalem. Okay, now what happens after that is um, Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, Jacob has 12 sons, okay? So they end up uh, in, they have 12 kids, they're 12 families, and they start having more families and more kids. There's a famine, they all end up in Egypt. So for 400 years, they're stuck in Egypt, okay? All the brothers actually die off, and now they're stuck in Egypt. God raises up Moses and says, Moses, I need you to get my people back into the land of Israel. The 12 brothers, it's like we have seven kids. So that would be like saying um, Cheyenne gets a piece of land and Dusty gets a piece of land, so, and they're descendants. So all of Cheyenne's kids live here, Dusty's kids live here. So that's what's happening, but it's 400 years of descendants, okay? So now they all, they're all back into Moses, Joshua leads them into the promised land, and they're all there. Now, here's a good point for us. God says you're my people. Okay, and the problem is, is that he, he's saying, I want you to be a light to all the countries around you, okay, the Moabites, the Hittites, all the people that don't know God, I'm giving you this land so that you can be a light to all the rest of the world. But the minute they got in there, they decided, no, nope, I don't think I want to do that. I think I want to just go do my own thing, okay? They walked away from God. 
They started worshiping idols. They started sacrificing children. Like they're taking something God has given them and just, they just ruin the whole thing, okay? So what happens is they're all, they all each have a portion of this land, okay? And, and I want to show you that uh, once that happens, uh, they, they decide they want a king. King Saul comes on the scene. He's, he disobeys God. God brings on David, who we're going to talk about next week. David has a son named Solomon. Solomon builds this beautiful temple for God. Um, if you see the picture in your handout right there, that is actually the land where the temple was on. Right now you see the dome on the, mo- on the rock and the mosque. Uh, the dome on the rock is a shrine to Muhammad. It's a very Islam site at this point. Um, someday that will all go away because um, it's, it's, it's God's land for, for you know, when Jesus comes back. Anyway, um, okay, where was I on that? So, um, I'm trying to get into Habakkuk. Oh, so anyway, okay, so the 10 tribes, so the 12 tribes. Now what happened is that um, you have all of these different boys, descendants, and they're each in one of these areas up here, okay? Now what happened is there's so much infighting between all these people that they split 10 tribes to the north, two tribes to the south. Two tribes down here is right by Jerusalem, where the big temple sits, okay, and, and the 10 tribes above. Now, the Assyrians come in and take over the 10 tribes above. They're, they're gone. The only two left are, are the ones right in Jerusalem. You've got Benjamin and the tribe of Judah. And God waits 100 years for them to repent. He says, I have given you so much. I've given you the temple. I've given you everything. And, and I'm giving you time to repent, and they refuse to do it. Okay, so now God says, all right, what, is God, what do we do when our children do something wrong? We discipline them. And now God is getting ready to discipline the balance of the nation of Israel. And, and this is where we meet Habakkuk. So Habakkuk walks in on the scene. He's a prophet. He's looking around going, this is just not fair, God. What is going on here? Like everyone's in chaos. I'm so confused as to what is going on around here. And you need to do something about it. And so Habakkuk cries out to God in Habakkuk 1. We'll start in verse 1. This is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Some of you feel that way right now. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence, and I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight, and the laws become paralyzed, and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. In other words, Habakkuk's looking around saying nothing about what is going on is fair. But, and the reason for that is because he knows that the one that's in control that can make it all better isn't. So somehow it's God's fault. And some of you are right there in your life right now. It doesn't even have to be Habakkuk thousands of years ago. You're sitting here saying, God, do you not see that my family is just in chaos and is not fair because you can do something about it and you're not. I've asked you to change my husband, you're not. I've asked you to change my child, you're not, okay? This is not fair, God. Okay, don't you see my health is failing? God, do, you can in one minute heal my blind eyes or heal my cancer or heal whatever it is is the problem, okay? And he's not doing it. So it's like, you're, God, what's the problem? You're just not being fair. Um, y- you just turn on the news and you see a terrorist beheading someone. And you're like, you've got to be kidding. God, don't you see what's going on? Do something about it because I know that you can. And God says, no, nope, I'm not doing anything yet. We're going to learn from Habakkuk what he needed to do. Um, I learned this whole idea about Habakkuk many, many years ago. If you've been here, I've told you the story before. Uh, we went to Israel. Uh, it was like our lifelong dream to go. Went there. Uh, my whole, I just couldn't wait to see the Sea of Galilee and see all the places where Jesus walked and the tomb and the Garden of Gethsemane. And like, I could not have been more excited and I could not have been more depressed when I came back. Okay, it was so. I love Israel. It's my favorite place. Saddest place to me. False religion, war. Like we went to a we went to a, one site where they we had a field trip. Here comes the bus with all the little children with like the Israeli army. Like you can't even go on a field trip without the army being there with their AK-47 so no one does anything to these kids. Like I'm like, who lives like this? So on this particular trip, we went to Hezekiah's tunnel, which it, there's two sides to, um, it, when you get to Jerusalem, they put a big wall around the city because they're so sick and tired of the Palestinians coming in and, and, and bombing people with their like suicide bombers. So. 
they've nixed that. They put a big wall around the city, and you don't come in, basically, is what happens. So outside the city is where a lot of Palestinians live, and inside is where the people in Jerusalem, uh, some of them live there, too. So we went into this tunnel, Hezekiah's tunnel. It's below ground, so it's underground under the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and basically, in the times of David, like uh, if they were going to be if someone was going to come in and try to capture the city, they would have an underground tunnel where they could bring in water. So that's what it was all about. So we went in there. If you have claustrophobia, don't ever do it. We were walking through walls underground that was like literally this big. And I thought, if there's an earthquake, this is my tomb. Like it was so frightening to me. So anyway, we came out on the other side. Now on the other side is the Palestinian side. Okay. So our bus is supposed to meet us right there, but it's not there. We're like, okay, this is probably not a good thing. We're in this little teeny tiny town that has, it was, it was the saddest place I've ever seen, okay? There's garbage everywhere. There's just, it's just filthy and little kids running around. And what happened was down at the end of the street where our bus couldn't get up was a, um, a, a taxi cab hit a horse, okay? And we thought there would be a riot. Like these Palestinian men were so angry and they're just, you know, I can't even understand their language, but they're so mad at this taxi cab driver and this big upheaval. And I'm thinking, okay, we just got to make it to our bus before we like die. So we get by there and, you know, of course, this one kid throws a rock at someone on our, on our bus. And so I get on the bus and I look down and there's this little five-year-old. And to this day, like, it's so hard for me to even talk about it because I look down at him and he has these big brown eyes, cutest thing I ever saw, filthy little dirty face. And he just looked up at me and I started crying. And I said, God, this is not fair. Here is this five-year-old adorable little child. He has no hope in life. Okay, he lives in a garbage pit. He's taught to hate you. He's taught to hate me. He's taught to hate every Jewish person there is. Everything about it, and it's not fair because you can do something about it, God, and you're not. Okay, so I came home that night and went to, as Rob, Rob went to bed, and I just sat there because I was still really, really super duper sad about it. And I was thankful for when someone told me one time, to get over your discouragement, you got to open up the Word of God. And just thankfully, I opened up Habakkuk. And that's where I landed with, with him because he gave me some answers I needed. Verse nine, 5 from Habakkuk, after he tells God how unfair he thinks life is, this is what God answers back to him. Look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I am doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. And that's what I put that on the card right in front of you. Because I want you, when you start thinking that God's not in control, I want you to put that somewhere where you can see it. And this is what I wrote. God is doing something, even though it seems he is not in control, that I would not believe even if someone told me. God is always working behind the scenes. Always. And you can, you can bet on that. Just by seeing little Israel being still there, God is always doing something nationally, personally, in your household, with your children. He promises that. Okay, we just got to get that in our, in our brains. He's always working behind the scenes. Because I think the thing is, is that it, he, there's always this big, big picture, and we tend to look at just what's, what's in front of us. I, I think that if somebody told you that your child would come to Christ, but he might have to go to prison first, and that's where he's going to find Jesus. You would be like, you wouldn't believe it, okay? If God told you that you would be single for 10 years because he's got somebody very perfect for you in 10 years, you probably wouldn't believe it. If God told you that the collapse of your business and all your personal belongings, you know, now gives you the availability to work in ministry, and thousands of people are going to come to Jesus because of that, you probably wouldn't believe it. Okay, if, if, if God told you that your spouse that just walked out the door would be the best thing that ever happened to you, you probably wouldn't believe it, okay? And, and, and if God told you, just like he told Jennifer, that she would be blind all of her life, but thousands and thousands of people would be encouraged by her story and come to know Christ, she probably wouldn't have believed it, okay? So sometimes God doesn't tell us what's going on. And just like Habakkuk, he had to get to the point of saying, God, I'm just trusting you. I don't understand it, and I don't get it. Now, what actually did happen? God finished telling him what was going to happen. God says, you know that uh, nation of, uh, in Iraq, okay? They were the Babylonians at the time. He says, the Babylonians are going to come in and they're going to wipe out the southern kingdom. Gone, okay? They burned the temple, that beautiful Solomon's temple, to the ground, okay? They took all the Jewish people, they took them captives into the other nation. It, it was a nightmare time and it was all because 
God says, you're my children, and I will not let my children continue in sin. You are going to be a light, just like what we do with our kids. You discipline them when they do something wrong, and that's what, what, um, what happened there. So when you and I start thinking, like, what's going on with Gaza and Israel, we need to remember God has a plan, and he knows what he's doing. When you see tornadoes, and you see you know, tsunamis and earthquakes, and you're going, God, where are you? He knows what he's doing. We have to get to the point like Habakkuk where we say, God, I just trust you. I don't like it and I don't get it, but I'm going to trust you. And that's exactly where Habakkuk came to. Chapter 3, verse 17, he tells God this after he finds out everything that's going to happen. He says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines and even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, okay? And we need to stop there and you put in whatever even though there's little five-year-old Palestinian boys that can't seem to get out, and even though your husband is walking out the door, and even though you're in a lawsuit that you don't like, and even though whatever, okay, this is the point we have to get to in verse six, um, 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength, and he makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. And that's where we have to get to when we start feeling like God is unfair. We need to stop and say, whoa, 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 God's doing something. I don't get it. I don't like it. I don't even understand it, okay? None of this even makes sense. But the sovereign Lord, which says God is in control. There's nothing ever out of his control. If I thought for one second that something was out of his control, I would fall apart, okay? I have to know that someone's running this world, and it doesn't always mean that things are going to go our way, but, but Habakkuk finally realized, I have to trust God that there's a bigger, bigger picture than just what I can see right in front of me. And that trip to Israel taught me one thing, how important it is to know the word of God. If you don't know it, when you get stuck in those, God, you're unfair and I'm miserable, and, and I, if you get stuck in there and you don't know the word of God, you're just going to be a mess, okay? You'll just completely fall apart. So this is what I learned about the question about, is God unfair? And this is where I landed this week with this. It dawned on me that God created this world perfect, okay? He created it beautiful. He's like, here, Adam and Eve, I just want you to just run around naked. You're fine. No one will ever know. You're just kind of like in the garden, okay? I assume, and I always say peanut M&Ms with no calories, okay? We're in the Garden of Eden. I, there's, there's no fat. There's no nothing. You just run around. Everything's beautiful. And God's like, that's how I want this world to go. But guess who ruined it? we did, okay? Adam and Eve sinned, but if they hadn't, I would have eventually, okay? That's just how life goes, but it was never God's original intention for this world to have sickness and disease and little Palestinian boys that are sad and war and violence. It was never in the cards for him, okay? But he gave us a free will to make choices, and we make choices every single day that go against what God calls us to do. And this is why I think that God is more than fair, because he gave us things like, like sex, okay? And, and he says, I'm giving you something beautiful in the context of a husband and a wife, okay? Man and woman in the context of marriage. And yet, what happens now? We've taken what he's given us as something beautiful and he's saying, yeah, you know what? I think uh, women should marry women and men should marry, wear, marry men. And I also think that of uh, uh, porn, you know, well, sex, whatever. So now porn is the greatest, largest business in the United States, okay? And you're thinking we've taken something that God has made so beautiful and we have just destroyed it, okay? That's not God's fault. That's ours, okay? He gives us medicine. We talked about medicine last week. And it's like, you know what? One pill isn't enough and now it's two and three and four and before you know it, you're in N.A., okay? Because now you're, you're addicted to, to pills. And, he, and God says, I'm giving you wine, okay? People are like, oh, you can't drink wine. Jesus' first miracle was God, turning water into wine. Pretty certain he didn't have a problem with wine. Pretty sure he drank wine, okay? He never got drunk, but we've taken wine and said, you know what? Instead of just like a drink of wine, I think I'll have like the bottle or two bottles, and now I'm totally trashed, okay? We take things that God has given us, and we just we just destroy him, okay? And, and now, this is why I think that God is so fair, because now God has this choice. And the choice is to do what he did with Noah. I'm just going to wipe out this whole world, okay? I'm done with it. It's ridiculous. But instead, he says, or 
I can sit here and I can be patient and patient and patient and wait for those to come to me, okay? And that's why I don't think that he is unfair. I think that he's very, very fair because he could wipe this whole world, he could wipe us out in a second. And he doesn't do it because here's the exciting news. This little earth that we live on is the only way that anybody can ever go, come to eternal life and go to heaven. It just is. There's no other way besides Jesus, okay? So if this world weren't here, there'd be no way that our friends or our relatives or our children could get to heaven without this earth just turning and God being patient with us, okay? And so I always had to come back to that the longer he keeps us here, the more patient he is, the more time we have to share the gospel with people so that other people can come to know him. Because once this earth is gone, there's no other hope for anyone to come to know him. Now, I put a, a little Zig, Zig Ziglar card in there, and I had to write it in. I don't even know if I can say this right. Because as a Christian, here's what we realize. This world is not our own. You always see those not of this world ticket. They really, it really isn't, okay? We're in God's story, okay? And we look for an eternity where there will be no disease and no crying and no, none of that bad stuff that we see that, by the way, we caused here on this earth, okay? So Zig Ziglar says, your faith is very important. I have done the math. You are going to be um, dead a whole lot longer than you will be alive. Now, Romans 8.22 says this, for we know that the whole creation grains, groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we ourselves having the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Now, the problem with being a Christian and knowing these things is that many people decide, and I'm going to talk to you for a minute, those of you who say, I don't want to be here anymore. I just heard of a pastor's wife, a pastor that we used to go to church to, his wife committed suicide last week. Could not even believe it. I'm like, you have got to be kidding. Because some people just say, I don't like the mess of this world, and I just want to check out. And that's who I want to talk to for just a few minutes, because I want to tell you this. As a follower of Jesus, in his story, that is never, ever an option for you. Ever. Okay? And this is why. Look at Psalms 139, because this is what God says. This is what David said about God. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth, your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your books were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. How precious also are your thoughts of, to me, O God, that how vast the sum of them, if I should count them, they would outnumber the sand when I awake and I am still with you. Okay, so that is how God feels about you. He's saying, I created you before you were even born. Like in your mother's womb, I wove you together because you are special. And when you join into my story, I have a purpose for you. I have a reason for you to live, okay? And, and as tough as blindness is for Jennifer, as tough as your situation is, God's saying, I want to take what you deem as unfair and I want to use you in this grand big scheme called life, okay, so that others can come to know him. Um, the next verse is Acts 17, 26. He says, from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. And here's the thing, that's you. That's saying, I have given you a life. I've formed you. I've put you in 2014 in Phoenix, Surprise, Anthem, wherever you live, okay? That's my place for you. Now I want to use you in a mighty way so other people can come to know you. And I have a purpose for you while you are living. Okay, now the problem is, is that a lot of people just sit around being miserable and thinking my life just sucks and, 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 and you know, I just want to go to heaven. Okay, and never, never did God ever want it to be like that. He's saying I, our job isn't to sit around. Our job is to do something to further the gospel. Here's an example. Um, I told you the Italians were at our house, uh, this whole group of Italian kids. They don't speak English very well and... Um, they uh, were at the house of five, and I told Cheyenne one day, I said, hey, uh, you know, are, can they go to church? Or you, what are you doing with them spiritually? She said, Mom, they're all atheists. And I'm like, what? I said, they're from Italy, for crying out loud. She says, they're all atheists. No one believes in God. And I said, okay, that's so heartbreaking. So I was in California, so I said, all right, 
I'm going to get them some books and some Bibles. We'll just get them books and Bibles. One online. Uh, Christian books in Italian. None. I was so shocked. I was like, you've got to be kidding. Okay, teen Bible in Italian. None. Okay, these kids, they, they, so I Googled like Italy. 80% of the people would say they're Catholic. 10, I think it was 10 or 20, I think it was more like 10, 10% actually practice. So you've got 80% of kids that are, are teenagers that have no idea who Jesus is. They're atheists because they're like, why would I want to go to this church who has this list of rules and regulations for me? Why do I want to do that? Okay, it's easier to not believe in anything than to actually believe in something. Okay, they can go party, they can drink, they can do whatever they want. They don't need to be accountable to anyone. So I was frustrated. Now, here's my choice. The world is just awful. I just, what are we going to do? Nothing. I'm just going to sit around and be miserable about it. I said, forget that. Rob and I talked. I said, we have to do something. Got online. Translating books from English to Italian. So we took our one-way book. Guess what? Un unica whatever blah blah blah. Okay, it is now translated into Italian. Okay, because uh, I'm like that's ridiculous. Okay, but those are our choices. Jennifer can sit around or she can take her blindness and do something about it. We were at a restaurant the other day, um, and there was a man in a wheelchair, and he had like a, I don't know he was in the Gulf War or something, and he was out. T talking to people about, you know, hey, come to this 3K run and we're trying to raise money for this or that. And we're looking at him like, this is so awesome. Like you're taking something really, really bad and you are using it for good. Romans 8.28 says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and to those who called according to his purpose. And the question always is, how is death or sickness or job loss going to work for good? And how is a painful divorce or an unhappy marriage or a wayward child, how does that work for good? And here's what I'm going to tell you. It does and it will if you let it, okay? The problem is so many people want to be in that bon bon peanut m and days of our life mode. Like, I don't want to do anything about it. I just want to bide my time until I go to heaven. No, not in God's story. That's not an option for you, okay? Figure out what it is that makes you so mad. What is the frustrates you in your life and then say, God, how do you want to use me? Okay, how do you want to use me? Because I'll tell you what, the depression that I went through that I told you about last week, if you had come to me before I went into that depression and said, I'm depressed, here's what I would have said. Serious? You live in the United States. What do you have to be depressed about? Get over it. Okay, that's what I would have said. But having been through it, now if you came to me, I would hug you and I would say, I know how dark it is. I get it, okay? So I, I will, uh, let me, how, how can I help you? Okay, but that takes being through something like that. Um, I, uh, the divorce, some of you are divorced and had nasty divorces and bitter, bitter child custody battles. Who better to help somebody else that's been through the same thing, okay? You've lost someone, you've lost a child, you've lost a grandchild. Who better to comfort somebody because you've been there before? Uh, Cheyenne, I told you most of our kids have OCD. She had this total OCD meltdown this summer. Like it was so bad. She'd call me in the morning. She's crying and she can't seem to get over. This went on for days. We had to call the doctor. We're trying to figure out what to do and how to get medicine there. And so one morning she calls me and we're down at breakfast and she's like, ah, she's all freaking out about everything. And um, I'm trying to comfort her. Cheyenne, I... Uh, how about this or try this? And this is what she said to me. You are not helping me, Mom. Is Micah there? And I'm like, yeah. She goes, hand him the phone. Because Micah has OCD. And he knows exactly what she's going through. So he's the one that can come through and help her. And that's what God says. Blindness, cancer, whatever you have, God's saying, in my story, I haven't forgotten you, okay? I want to use you. Because John 16, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that, that you, you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world, you will have tribulations and trials and distress and frustration, but be of good cheer. Take courage, be confident, certain, and undaunted, for I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of its power. And see, that's really comforting news to know that the longer we understand that there's this big, big picture going on and that God's still involved, it makes us be less discouraged. Um, I want to end with this. This is how our, um, we have to realize this, is that part of that big picture includes things that we don't like. 
Okay, it just does. You can't make that better. Things that seem unfair to us. If you remember John the Baptist when we talked about him, here's John the Baptist. Okay, he's all of his life, all he wants to do is tell people about Jesus. Jesus comes on the scene. He's like, don't follow me anymore. Now follow Jesus. This is who the, the lamb of the world is, okay? Uh, and so people start following Jesus. And what happens to John the Baptist? He ends up in prison. And while he's in prison, behind prison walls, where he can't see what's going on outside those prison walls, he starts doubting. God, where are you? This is not fair. Why haven't you broken me out? Why haven't you called cookies in bloom? Okay? Why haven't you sent me a prison cookie bouquet? Like, I just don't understand that, Jesus. That's just not fair. Okay? But here's the thing about it, is that while he's sitting in there, he asks his friends, his disciples, he said, go and ask Jesus, are you really the Messiah? And some of us are there, we're just going, are you really God? Is there even a God? And, and, and this is what Jesus sends back to, to John. He said, tells his me- the disciples, he says, go tell him this. So, the mess- so he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is being preached. In other words, he's saying, John, even though you can't see anything behind those prison walls, and for some of you, you're behind those prison walls of health, crisis, family, whatever, and he's saying, please don't give up. What's going on beyond those walls, I'm in control of. I know what's going on. I need you just to hang in there, okay? Don't give up. And as John's friends were leaving, Jesus says one last thing to him. You can just hear him, whoa, 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 guys. Wait, 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 before you go and talk to um, John the Baptist, I need you to tell him one more thing, and this is kind of the most important thing. Luke 7, 23, blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Blessed are you and blessed are me when we don't walk away when we think God is unfair. Blessed are you and me when we look around and we see the world and it doesn't make sense to us, but we refuse to walk away from our faith. Because sometimes God flat out says no, okay? Our job is to pray, our job is to ask, but a lot of times he says no. The Apostle Paul is the perfect example. He gets some kind of, uh, no one knows what it is, eyesight problem, epilepsy, no one really knows. Begged God three times to take it away from him. God, please, I could be so much more effective for you, okay? It's all about you, God, but I could be so more effective if you would take this away. And here's what God said to him. No, no. My grace is sufficient for you. I'll give you all the grace you need. And sometimes he doesn't take away the bad stuff in our life. Sometimes he just gives us the grace to be able to make it through so that other people can look at us and say, what is so different about them? I want that God that they believe in. And and this is where we, we landed here, is that God always has every right to say no to us, but it doesn't mean that he's unfair. But what it means is that just like Habakkuk that night had to come to this conclusion that I am just a tiny little part in God's grand big story, okay? And so are you and so are me. And so we have to figure out what our part in that grand story is. Um, The last verses of Psalm 115, 3 are, God is in heaven, he does as he wishes. Daniel 2.21, he controls the course of the world events. So those of you that watch the news all the time and you're wondering what's going on, Always remember what's on front of your card. God is doing something, even though it seems he is not in control, that I would never believe if someone told me. And so while we're still living on this earth, our job is to tell other people about saving faith in his son Jesus. And for those of you that are here or watching us online or however you're watching us, if you don't even know what that means, it's really simple. God, I want to move from my story to your story, and I want Jesus to come in my life, and when he does, he will change everything about you. He will give you hope in this world, and it's really, really simple. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the life of Habakkuk. Thank you that, that he just reminds us that, God, we just have to be whatever you want in our life for us. And God, for those that are going through really, really difficult situations, please help them to never, ever walk away because they are like John the Baptist by prison walls inside. They can't see what's out, but God, give them vision to know that just because they can't see you, you've never forgotten them. You've created them from the moment they were born and ordained the number of their days. God, help us to have enough courage to use what's bad in our life 
to bring others to you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to make it better. I want you to make it better. And the question is going to be, what if he never makes it better? See, I'm here. Pray. Praise the Lord. Okay, there. Hallelujah. And they could you go, aren't you miserable? No, I'm really not. What do you have that I don't have? Jesus. Don't shut down. Don't give up. Don't become bitter. Surround yourself with people who love Jesus. But I promise you that I think today you'll be really, really encouraged at the very end because I learned something I never even thought of.